let's get to our founder's story. And let's call up Jeff Burbank from Next Stage Medical. Now, I've been interviewing CEOs for a long time. I've met a lot of founders. I've met a lot of founders that have built incredible companies. And I got to say, Jeff is one of the most humble ones, uh, people I've ever met who has accomplished such great things. Um, so Next Stage Medical is a home hemodialysis company so that people on dialysis with uh, chronic kidney failure, kidney disease can, can have their treatment at home. And uh, you know, I don't know if you guys were here last year, but I actually had found out that I had a, a rare kidney disease uh, a couple days before our last uh, Boston device talks. And uh, that was a great six days in the hospital. It was awesome. But uh, really started me thinking about the uh, patients on dialysis and, and really, my God, you know, those kidneys, you don't think about them at all. But once, uh, once there's problems, they, they become, it becomes quite uh, apparent how important they are. So I'm really excited to sit down with uh, Jeff here and, and, and learn a little bit more about his story. Thanks for having me, but we're going to leave the humble part behind. We just made the top 100 list. So. <laughs> yeah. It's a big list, I'm telling you. So, Jeff, in doing some research for this interview, I, I was struck by something I read in the uh, Charleston Gazette. And it was an article. It's an interesting article. It's about a woman who had, had seen some really uh, some drastic improvement in her chronic kidney disease. But it was something she said about the moment she learned of her diagnosis. And uh, it had progressed to the point of that she needed dialysis as a bridge to, to a transplant. And she said, no, I'm not going to do the treatment. I'm just going to accept, I'm going to accept my fate. And uh, it was a quote she said. She said, I had seen dialysis clinics. And it was a, like a sea of comatose bodies. So I decided I was never, ever going to do dialysis. I was, I was fine, so I had plenty of time to make peace. And I decided to go peacefully. If you could, please explain to me how this sentiment resonates with you. First, as someone who's made his career treating these patients, and as a person who has interacted with so many patients in this position in, their, in his career. Well, I think everybody's probably familiar with somebody that's been on dialysis, that's had kidney failure, and, and what you go through. So that's a, that's a truly understandable sentiment. Um, it's a pretty depressing place. The mortality rate of those patients is about 25% annually. So, you know, literally the person to the left or right of you is, is not going to be there for very long. Uh, it's very regimented because it's one of the most mature therapies that we have. Uh, in, in medical, and it's one of the most unique reimbursement structures that has really, in one way, created a phenomenal value because it's matured and been refined and, and gotten to uh, really uh, a level of operationalized that the patient has been lost in it. So uh, technology was invented years ago to keep patients alive, but what we'd like to think is we're uh, a, a part of giving them a life, you know, that our technology can help the patients do what they want to do in life versus live to go to dialysis three times a week for a therapy that lasts about four hours. Mm -hmm. um, on average, it takes seven or eight hours for them to cover, recover from the therapy. So it's just all consuming just to survive. So there are a number of patients that, that look at that decision and say, we'll let nature take its course. And, um, obviously, that's not the course that we were uh, right. hoping for, yeah. and I think we've, we've really bent that curve and done some amazing things. So let's back up. I mean, I sort of gave a cursory review of, of what Next Stage does, but maybe you'd like to improve upon my <laughs> description or expand upon it. Yeah, so um, dialysis is an operationalized therapy that takes place in, a, in a, um, an outpatient facility typically three times a week for about four hours. Uh, takes a little time to get on the therapy and off the, time, off the therapy, so it really consumes uh, three days a week for the patient. And due to the number of patients on the therapy and due to the expense of that, it's been matured to the point where it really is a factory. Um, and all the technology was designed to facilitate that factory, that most efficient delivery of the therapy in the shortest period of time 
and the most number of patients through a dialysis center uh, to amortize the overhead and the labor. Um, we looked at it totally differently and said, um, one, you could probably improve clinical outcomes if you can customize the therapy to the patient versus the patient to the therapy, right. not put every patient on uh, four times or three times a week, four hours a day. Uh, to do that, we thought it had to be patient driven uh, and the location didn't want to be in a center, it wanted to be at home. So well, we started with a white piece of paper and designed technology that was simple enough, cost effective enough, flexible enough, easy enough, safe enough to uh, take those structures, break them down so that patients could do the therapy where they wanted, when they wanted, under the prescription of their physician. So really totally turned it upside down. But home hemodialysis is not actually a very new concept, right? I mean, I think I read that you said that it, it, it was first became available in the late 60s and early 70s and was predominantly done at home because of the lack of hospital or clinic-based facilities. I think you said that like roughly 40% of patients undergoing hemodialysis were doing it at home in the early 70s, right? They were, and that was at a time before dialysis centers uh, were really available and reimbursement didn't wasn't widely available as well. So it, those were primarily um, patients that had means, and it was a small number of patients, even though a high percentage, because there weren't that many patients on dialysis at that time. What kind of machines were they using at that point? Uh, they looked a lot like uh, old washing machines. <laughs> they, uh, dialysis has come a long way. It's been a phenomenal um, example of what can happen in a technology area. Mm -hmm. So. Um, they, they literally were, um, you know, something that would look arcane to us now. Uh, dialysis does two things. Uh, you know, it's removing toxins and it's removing fluid from the patient. So it's, it's at its simplest form. It's a, uh, a bunch of blood circuits and, and fluid pathways mm -hmm. that do this. And in the early days, they literally were tubs filled with dialysate and, wow. a, and a membrane sunk inside them. So it's come a long way. And then what, what precipitated the shift into the clinic-based or the hospital-based care? Reimbursement. Uh, reimbursement. Reimbursement that was, uh, and it, for those of you that don't know, dialysis is one of the only entitlements. Doesn't matter what age you are, after 30 months, you'll become a Medicare-covered individual. So it is a very unique program in that um, Medicare pays for approximately 90% of the patients in the country um, as a result. So it's, it's, it's really a, a unique segment of healthcare. Uh, it's, it's a capitated environment. So in a lot of ways, I think of dialysis as, you know, setting the trends in a lot of medicine. And when you started your career, you've been working with, in this field for, for a bit. When did you start your career? Right out, of, uh, right out of school in, in the mid-80s. Okay. Yeah. What did the industry look like when you started? You were in the dialysis space then, correct? Yeah, so um, not a lot different than what it looks like today. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the companies, most of them are around. There's been some aggregation there. Um, there's a whole lot more patients, so we have three times the number of patients that we did in the 80s. Uh, it's grown about between five and 10% a year, so tremendous growth rate in number of patients. Mm -hmm. The technology has incrementally improved um, on, for traditional in-center, and then you know, we, we kind of went a different direction, which is, which is starting to create a new option for patients. Right. So there's a couple different uh, entrepreneurs. They're sort of ac accidental entrepreneurs and very intentional ones. What, what, how would you describe yourself? Are you an accidental entrepreneur, or are you somebody that set out to start a company? Um, so uh, I was always an entrepreneur. Uh, so I, I'm an entrepreneur first, probably, and a, a, a dialysis entrepreneur second. So I, I did a lot of entrepreneurial things growing up. So it was always my calling. I just didn't know where it would get applied. And I got very excited about how you can change the course of a chronic patient's life. And uh, trained as an engineer, so you know, where do you want to apply that? Uh, this was a phenomenal area where you could really impact the course of someone's life. So, so you say you were always an entrepreneur, though? I really was, yep. Like uh, 
in high school, I was building example. hydroponic greenhouses for people. Oh, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and it's, uh, okay. <laughs> Where'd you grow up? Next question. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's talk about the scientific and business reasons as to why this was the right space for you in this, in what is now your career, basically. So, so we saw a space. Um, traditional dialysis had matured to be so big and so industrial and the production defined the product so much. There was so much inflexibility. And the literature was emerging. As you said, there was some folks doing home dialysis and some were doing some really progressive work and saying, well, what happens if you dialyze a little bit more? It's kind of counterintuitive because dialysis is pretty brutal on the body when you yeah. do it three times a week. But some said, you know, like other medical specialties, if we do it more frequently, maybe we can manage the patients in a tighter zone. Maybe we can get better clinical outcomes. Maybe we can reduce hospitalization. So the literature started to move and say, that's a huge opportunity. Maybe we can cut costs, improve quality of life. But there wasn't a technology that exists that allowed patients to kind of make that transition from the end center. As you, you really couldn't take the existing technology and put it in your home. You'd have to right. literally build a dialysis center in your home. So there needed to be an innovation. And we thought that the incumbents would be slow to respond because they couldn't take their current assets and redeploy them to this opportunity that you really did have to develop ground up for it. So we thought that gave us enough opportunity to go through that window. And in fact, they were slower than we thought to respond. We went through the window. We've created a, you know, a business that will, will have revenues over $350 million this year. We have 3,300 employees. And you know, it's, it's been a phenomenal run. That's awesome. But you knew that the, they were, the incumbents were slow because you were working at one, right? Yes, and I knew yeah. the limitations. So, you know, we all talk and investors talk about the product. And very few people really get below that and realize that behind a product is a whole supply chain and a manufacturing capability. And in our case, we even design our own automation because the results of automation define your economics, your quality, your performance so well that that's a strategic advantage. Yeah. So when you design a product in our space, you're also designing a whole manufacturing system to make it because we have high volume disposables that have to have a quality that's unbelievable. I mean, we're taking patients' blood out of their body in their home and returning it safely. So the, it, it's in a sense a consumer product that has medical acuity. It's an amazing thing to do. Yeah. So it, you can't just pivot that way. Your, your capabilities are defined by your manufacturing infrastructure, and we didn't think those would apply to this new world. So you see all this literature as you're working in this space. I assume this, you're seeing this in your position. I think you were at Gambro or something like that? I was, yep. Uh, did you think, well, we need to do this as a company, or did you think that I have to do this as a spin out or as an independent I, company? I was, some would argue that I wasn't a great employee, but I was a good one on this one. I, I wanted to do this at Cobe and Gamro. Yeah. Um, tried to do it there for a while and, and couldn't get traction. So, um, Why? I mean, just because it didn't make economic sense for them? They were making too much money? or, or? I, You know, it was when you have an operating business to take significant capital and apply it, apply it to a high risk potential reward is a tough thing to do. Yeah. Venture capital model works a lot better for that. Yeah. So. so you say, uh, you say why, well, like do you go home and say, uh, you know, you're married, do you have children at this point? Or? I'm, I'm married to a phenomenal woman. Yeah. <laughs> Same one that yeah. I was married to at the start of this. Yeah. Uh, we have four kids, four yeah. boys. So do you go home and say, so I'm leaving my cushy job and I'm gonna do this thing? Or, I mean, how That's why that? I always have to say how phenomenal she was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, that was, uh, she's brave. <laughs> but you didn't actually, it's not linear, right? You started Vasca first. 
I before did. you started Next Stage. So yeah, Next Stage was the second company, which was a spin out from the first company. So you had the hypothesis in your mind, but you saw a different path there with Vasco when you started that in 1996? Yeah, so Vasco was an implantable vascular access port designed for dialysis patients, and that was presented to me as an opportunity by a surgeon and a nephrologist that wanted to start a company. Mm -hmm. And I always assumed that if we're gonna move the therapy home, we need to make vascular access uh, easier to do for patients. Right. Um, so I applied my efforts there first. So this was, is this like engineering thinking? This is 1.0 kind of thing? I mean. Uh, a, a little bit, it was this problem needed to be solved in my mind before okay. you could get to the bigger problem of moving dialysis to the home. That's yeah. interesting. But you, you, you didn't stay with Vasco, you spun Next Stage out of Vasco. That's right, so yeah. I, I spun Next Stage out, I moved to Next Stage, was chairman of Vasco for a while. Okay. That's an interesting move. It, it, was, uh, it was my training wheels, to be honest. <laughs> I learned a lot at Vasca. Um, if nothing else, and many of you have, have experienced this, it uh, takes a, a lot of courage to run a startup. And uh, Vasca kind of gave me the confidence and courage to do what I was able to do at Next yeah. Stage. And, and what, 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 uh, what was the end result when you left in 1999? Did you, you stayed on the board in that company it ultimately oh, got sold. sold. Okay. Yeah. What would you think was the the most important thing you learned there that you took with you on next stage? And it doesn't it probably for the benefit of this audience not technical. Yeah, no, it, it was um, you probably if you're the you probably do know your business better than the money. <laughs> that you know uh, there's a lot of smart money, there's a lot of great venture capitalists that can add a lot but they're not in the day-to-day -day of the market, the technology, the product. And if you feel so strongly about something, you know, go down fighting versus cave. Right. And so Next Stage opens its doors in 1999. How many people are in that, in that office with you? Are you in a garage or are you? Uh... Uh, we, were, we were borrowing space from Vasco. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, yeah, because you're spinning it out. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Coincidentally, uh, I mean, did, how did your investors at Vasca feel about that? The very spread? supportive. Okay. Uh, two shots on goal. Okay. <laughs> well, one went in, right? Yeah. So good. Yeah, they did. <laughs> they they did like nicely on Vasca. Good. good. Or on, on Next Stage too. So let's talk about when you're starting this company, and you're looking at it. You're saying, okay, we know that patients will experience better outcomes if they have more frequent exposure to dialysis. We know that that's better done at home. You're a little strong. No is not the okay, word. So I mean, we, we thought, we, we hoped. Yeah, yeah. We hoped yeah. that this was the case because our you know, instincts led us this way. But you look at the market and you're literally going against, you know, like you said, a factory. Yeah. Massive, massive companies. Yep. What's your philosophy in taking these companies on as a competitor? So it's funny because I was listening to the previous group about disruptors, disruption. I spent a lot of my time talking about not being a disruptor because a disruptor is not something you want to have a discussion with the FDA about. <laughs> uh, it's not something you want to have with a clinician because it implies risk and chronic care is generally very conservative. So I spent a lot of time talking about how we were going to add a capability that would be good for a group of patients so that we could kind of work our way in there and try not to take on directly um, and try to deflect all of that kind of energy because that energy can end up working against you versus working for you. So you, you say that you take them, you, I think you told us once that you, you find cracks in the business model to fill. Yeah. So that's what you did. Yes. It was an unmet need yeah. that existed in the market. We helped to define it, expand the unmet need, and fulfill that unmet need. What, yeah. do, you, what do you think has been the biggest resistance point for you guys? Oh, it's, it's absolutely that people are comfortable with what they're doing. It, it, the whole system is set up from every aspect, and you know the previous group hit on a bunch. You've got reimbursement, clinical practice, infrastructure, product cost and quality and maturity. Mm -hmm. There's just so many different vectors that come at you that uh, you know have to be dealt with, right. and uh, y you have to find ways to show success along the way so people continue to believe and see progress towards 
your your you know you you create a dream and you sell the dream and then you try to create reality against that dream and you have to be very systematic about how you pre present those successful steps so people continue to believe in the dream right so when you start at next stage and you're looking and you're in this ecosystem where you have these big massive companies you must have been thinking i'll build this and i can i can i can exit to a, a bigger company or, or did you we never really thought about it that way i you know Either we were dumb, because that would have been a great strategy, and, and I, I'd be on a beach somewhere now. But no, we always thought that that the way to build a company is to build a company that you're focused on creating a large, independent, successful company. That that's the better strategy, because you can't control buyers, acquirers strategy. So you could get to that point and not be making the investments that would carry you forward and mm -hmm. and get cream. So we always. Every discussion we ever had was about how do we build a great company. Yeah, and, and I think that's a great point because I do think that there's a lot, especially as we cover the industry, and if you look at technology, there's always, there seems to be a huge emphasis on the exit or the liquidity event. And, and you know, do you, I don't think enough entrepreneurs think about building a great company. So what do you see as, as even in the early days, what were some of the things you thought about to create a great company? Like, what did you, what were some of the ingredients you thought that that cake needed? Yeah, people, people, people. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, I think everybody likes to make it about technology, markets, those things. It's not, it's about getting, and, and they're right over here too. It's about putting together the best team you can possibly put together because people solve problems, people find markets, people make production work, you know, it, it's all about people and creating an environment where uh, successful people, it, you know, talented people can be successful. So it, it really, and they'll, they'll push you and they'll drive you and sometimes even drive you nuts, but mm -hmm. they, it's, uh, it's all about people. Uh, I assume you, you've learned this in your uh business school background, right? You have an MBA? <laughs> that was a setup question yes, for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so no, you don't have I an don't MBA. Have an MBA. Right? <laughs> no. But, so you didn't learn that. But my father school. did. Father <laughs> <was like>. <laughs> <laughs> One order removed. But everybody that works for you now has an MBA. <laughs> Pretty much, I yeah. guess. So you kind of learned on the job, right? I mean, uh, what was the hardest? I mean, what, do, you, do you remember some of the mistakes you made? Earlier. How long is this? <laughs> we can pick a couple. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it takes you a while to figure out how to identify and motivate good people. Uh, you know, getting through an interview process and understanding, are they real? Are they, can they get things done? Because you can't hide in a, in a startup or a fast-growing company. Everybody's got to be following. There's this great um, saying about, you know, carrying the emperor and yeah. all the people carrying the emperor and are they actually pushing up to lift the emperor or are they hanging on yeah. and in a fast growing company everybody has to be pushing up we all have to be carrying the ball forward and so finding people that actually can do that versus talk about it um, you know you got to sort through that and then knitting together a team because you want diversity because that you know there's strength and power that comes out of that but you have to function too. So the blend between the individual and the team is, is very interesting. In that metaphor, who's the emperor? Are you? No. <laughs> no, it's actually probably just a stone. <laughs> yeah. So you told me uh, that you kind of operate under the assumption that you have three stakeholders. Um, uh, that's uh, your patients, right? Your shareholders and your employees? Yes. What's the trick to making sure one doesn't supersede the other I think the first is to be clear with all three that you know my role is to be the referee my role is to find the right balance uh, to reward all of those stakeholders appropriately um, not let one take from another inappropriately uh, that builds I think some trust and some confidence and some understanding going in um, and then you know you, 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 it's communication dialogue thought uh, all those types of things that, that go into it. But, you know, being clear about 
what your goal is, how you operate, how you think about this with those stakeholders is really valuable. And it solves a lot of problems. In my case, it solves a lot of problems moving forward. You, you have a 97% approval rating on Glassdoor. Did you know that? <laughs> my assistant tells me. <laughs> <laughs> She's very proud of it. <laughs> I'm no math major. That's pretty good. <laughs> Oh, I'm trying to find those three people. <laughs> <laughs> and when you do, um, try not to be humble on this one. How, how do you, I mean, Glassdoor is becoming a more important thing every day as workers are getting more. Uh, it's a huge recruiting tool. You, know, uh, you do have to pay attention to your, your presence, your web presence. You've got to make sure that the message is getting out because you're competing for talent. So. Yeah. You want to create, this is another aspect of how do you get the best people. You've got to have the best footprint on the web that says, this is a great place to work. You know, he's an inspiring CEO. Yeah. Which once they get to know me, then, you know, <laughs> that's a different issue. But well, you can at least create it on the internet. I think you're pretty, pretty inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be humble. How did you do that? How do you, how do, you know, 9.7 out of 10 So people. you were asking me earlier, what did I learn about Vasca yeah. uh, at Vasca? One of the things I learned is how important culture is. And that was probably one of the hardest thing for me because I'm trained as an engineer. Right. So like I'm over here and, and, but I realized that if you're just honest about it and you go, they're laughing. If, if you go and you just be yourself as dorky as you are and you talk to people about it and you talk to them about the value of it and why we need it, um, it becomes real and believable and you got to live it and you can't be contradictory to it. But, um, you know, a, a culture, if you were to have the opportunity to come to the next stage, the first thing you see when you come in is our mission statement, which is a bit unique. It, you probably haven't seen one like it. And, you know, we, we start every meeting with one of the elements of it. We talk about it all the time. There's a thing I call cultural dilution, which is really growth rate. There were times where we were tripling our revenue every year for three years in a run, row. Think about that. Wow. So we had points where 70% of our employees were new within the last 12 months. So that's huge cultural dilution. Yeah. And you have to offset that by working really, really hard at teaching people what are the next stage values? How do we interact with each other? What do we believe in? How do we work? How do we play? All those kinds of things. Uh, hugely uncomfortable to an engineer, yeah. but it's really important for creating a, a company. How did you create those values? Were they something you sat down uh, day one with your pen and the notepad? Or no, we paid a consulting firm. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they said be authentic. <laughs> we, we grabbed a, a group of the initial employees we said we'll have two meetings, we'll have an hour meeting now, and then we'll wait two weeks and we'll reread what we wrote. And that's what came out of it. And I, uh, I think we're probably more proud of it today because it's still very relevant yeah. uh, as it was. So it was created by Next Stage, so it's part you, of us. You are a bit of a rare breed in that you started your company, you, you brought it public, you're still there, you're f uh, 16, 17 years later? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. I mean, are, are you impressed by this? I'm impressed by this. I mean, <laughs> you you uh, knew how hard it was. I mean, did you think, how many I, times I, during this journey were you like, if, if I could just Oh, I've been fired like six times, else. so. <laughs> 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 no, I, I, uh, I'm not impressed by it. I'm, I'm, I'm honored that everybody still believes I'm the right guy to run the company. I never thought, like, the company's not Jeff Burbank. The company's next stage. Yeah. And it's, uh, uh, it, it's really incredible to me that I'm still relevant given where we are. And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a blast. Yeah. But I'm the first, I'm a big shareholder. So if there's somebody better to run next stage, come talk to me because if we can make more money with somebody else or do better, I'm the first guy that'll move aside because it's, it's about that value creation. There's a lot of really talented people in this room, so we probably yeah. Be careful what you ask for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you? Uh, I, I know you've used a lot of things to become a better boss. I mean, you, you, you I think you said you do coaching and, and all that stuff. I do. Um, it, it's it's funny. A lot of people have uh, an issue saying they have a coach. I mean, 
show me Olympic athlete that doesn't have a coach. Yeah. And I've had great coaches. Um, I don't know if I wear them out or they, I don't know what happens, <laughs> but they, you do get stale because you need edginess between you and your coach that so you need them to call you out on stuff. And you, you, I, I am a bit of a relationship guy, so I think you build a relationship that takes away some of that edginess. So I do turn them over every once in a while and the company has grown. So what I needed to learn you know, 10 years ago isn't what I need to learn today. Um, so I tried to keep the coaching fresh, have a phenomenal board that's been incredibly helpful, um, very diverse in, in skills and people. So that's been really helpful. And you know, I, I just wanna be successful. So I, I wanna listen and soak up anything I can. So you're a founding CEO, so are you a yeller? No, I have yelled. <laughs> Um, and th I think the whole company stops when I yell because I'm not a yeller, oh, no. <laughs> and it, everyone knows. Are you a 4 a.m. emailer? Uh, rarely, uh, accidentally from somewhere in the planet, <laughs> but not <laughs> intentionally. Are you a workaholic? Uh, I, I work a lot. Um, you know, I'm, I'm proud, with that said, uh, here's a little statistic. We haven't had a single divorce in the country, in the company. Wow. So we, we've, I think it's really yeah, important to, <laughs> I think it may be, it's a combination of we respect that and try to be very flexible and we hire well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it is a, it's a blend of things, but um, I, have a, I have four boys, we've got a lot of family, and you know, my world has two pieces, and those two pieces, and I'm a better boss because I'm a, I'm a good, good dad and husband. So. I'd like to close on, on, on that, the one stake, that last stakeholder, that, the, the first stakeholder we talked about, the patient, and, and just the, what you're giving to these folks, and uh, what the stigma that people on dialysis suffer from. Uh, besides the disease, uh, what's the what's the perception that we have to break about these folks? Yeah, thanks for asking because you know this is where I'm going to get animated. Um, if you go into a dialysis center, you're probably going to go in there during work hours. What you're going to see during work hours are people that don't have a job. So they're going to be the oldest, most frail. They're going to look like uh, they're unhealthy. There's a perception due to dialysis patients going to the hospital, those are the most acute. There's a perception that dialysis patients didn't manage their diabetes or hypertension, so they're non-compliant, so it's their fault that they became a dialysis patient, which is absolutely insane. They probably didn't have the tools, they probably didn't have the opportunity, and that carries all the way through people saying, that patient can't do home hemodialysis, or that patient can't you know, be successful on dialysis, and that's ridiculous. It's our obligation to give these people an opportunity, give them the chance to do it, to take control of their life, give them the tools to do that, and not be uh, held to the stigma of, oh, you're non-compliant, therefore we're, we're gonna accept you know, mediocrity yeah. for them. And it, it just, you know, we're trying to change that and, we need your help in changing that. Because how many people in the population end up on dialysis? One out of 10, about? So there's, no, it's, it's less than that, but there's, uh, so there's about 500,000 dialysis patients in the country okay. right now. Okay, so it's yeah. much, much more rare. Yeah, much there's one out of 10 has kids, kidney disease, okay. but fewer than that, uh, you know, last to dialysis is a bad way to say it. Yeah. And I, I would imagine you hear from them a lot, these patients. We do. Uh, that's great, though. Uh, we bring patients to our all-hands meetings, uh, never a dry eye in the room with those. Yeah. So we all feel so proud of what we're doing for them. But I, I, I don't want to steal your thunder. Are you going to mm -hmm. finish what that lady wrote in? If you could finish the quote, you can. All right. Well, <laughs> so I she did. said she'd never go on dialysis. Then she found out about Next Stage yeah. and went on dialysis. And she's been very successful and then went on to get a transplant. So, um, you know, just it, it's, I don't have to work at the mission. Yeah. <laughs> I have to work at communicating the mission and, and figuring out how to get the team working well and, and uh, articulating the objectives. But the mission is so powerful. 
that you know it, it sells itself. Absolutely. Well, that's it's just a, a wonderful story. It's a wonderful technology, and uh, thanks so much for sharing that with us today. Thanks for uh, Thank delaying your commute home. <laughs> Well, guys, thank you so much for being with us today. We look forward to hosting you again next year. This time uh, we'll be in California in December, where we'll be uh, looking into the Google and J&J &J collaboration uh, with their new CEO at Verb Surgical and another uh, amazing panel of speakers. You all have been an amazing audience. Uh, our other members uh, who have won the Big 100 are pleased welcome to come up and get your award take pictures. The rest of you, please go in peace. Have a wonderful night. I love you all. Thank you so much. Thanks for five years.